Auto Line Daily is brought to you by Bridgestone, passion for excellence. This is Auto Line Daily for August 12, 2010, and now the news that we've all been waiting for. General Motors reported its second quarter earnings today, posting a net profit of $1.3 billion on revenues of just over $33 billion. But even more surprising than GM's profit is the fact that GM Chairman Ed Whitaker announced he will step down as CEO next month and leave GM at the end of the year. He'll be replaced by Dan Ackerson, another executive from the telecommunications industry who is already on the GM board. Now back to the numbers. On an operating basis, GM made almost $1.6 billion in North America but lost $160 $160 million in Europe, although that's actually a big improvement for Europe. GM's international operations, which include the rest of the world, but mostly China and South America, posted a $672 million operating profit. Two other tidbits of information we dug out of the numbers. In the American market, over 42% of the passenger cars the company sold went to fleets. When combined with trucks, One out of three vehicles went to fleets. On another note, GM's North American plants are operating at nearly a 93% capacity utilization rate, which is a pretty good number. This is an industry that spends a lot of time talking about electric cars, but electric trucks might make more economic sense. The Wall Street Journal reports Federal Express is testing electric delivery trucks in a variety of cities in the U.S. and Europe and says the results look promising. FedEx thinks it can operate electric trucks for one-third of the cost of a diesel-powered truck, and that includes the massive upfront purchasing cost of the electric ones. One analyst says electric step-in vans could capture 30% of the market by 2015, and electric shuttle buses and school buses could hit 20%. And speaking of electrics, is the great big battery shakeout about to begin? According to the Detroit Free Press, Massachusetts-based A123 Systems has withdrawn from the Fiat 500 EV program after reporting a $34 million second quarter loss. The reason it backed out is twofold. The volumes for that 500 EV have diminished from what they initially expected, and a competing supplier was willing to buy the business at a loss. Chrysler has not identified its new partner, but a Canadian company called Electrovia is supplying lithium ion batteries for a test fleet of plug-in electric Dodge Rams. And interestingly, former Chrysler president Tom Lasorda is a director at Electrovia. Nissan announced pricing of its new crossover vehicle, the Juke, that's due to go on sale this October. The base version starts at just under $19,000, but if you equip it with a CVT or all-wheel drive, both of which are optional, the price jumps to nearly $25,000. It's important to note, though, these prices do not include the destination charge, which was not provided in the press releases. All Juke models come with a 1.6-liter direct-injection turbo four-cylinder gas engine, which can be mated to either a six-speed manual or the CVT. Look for combined fuel economy of 29 miles per gallon, and that is eight liters per 100 kilometers. A few months back, we reported that researchers successfully hacked a vehicle through its diagnostic port and could cause a vehicle to give false readouts or even prevent the brakes from working properly. And now, according to Ars Technica, Researchers from Rutgers and the University of South Carolina were able to hack into a car through the tire pressure monitor. The system's wireless, so hackers just need to be nearby to hack in. The researchers used radio sensors and other software to identify and track vehicles remotely and make the dashboard give out false readings. The results were not as bad as the previous study because Hackers only have a limited amount of time because the tire pressure monitor only sends signals every 60 to 90 seconds. But it does show just how easy it is to hack into a vehicle. Yesterday, Ford made a huge powertrain announcement that'll be music to truck buyers' ears. It is offering four, count them, four different engine options on the 2011 F-150, and each of them is matched exclusively to six-speed automatic transmissions. Starting at the top, the strongest power plant available will be a 6.2-liter V8 shared with the Super Duty. 
output is the same as in the Raptor at 411 horsepower and 434 pound-feet of torque. Stepping down a notch is a 3.5 liter EcoBoost V6, specially upgraded for rear-wheel drive applications. No power or torque figures are available yet, but Ford says it can tow up to 11,300 pounds, the same amount as the 6.2 liter V8. The company expects the volume engine to be its new 5 liter V8 that was recently introduced in the Mustang. It delivers 360 horsepower and 380 pound-feet of twist. This is all exciting news, but the most interesting part of the equation is what Ford's doing with the base engine. It's a 3.7 liter V6 delivering 300 ponies and 275 pound-feet. To ring that much out of a relatively small engine, Ford had to make a number of tweaks and upgrades. And again, we've added content and technology, uh, twin independent variable cam timing. We've upped the compression ratio. Um, uh, the cylinder heads are new because we did, we did the, really the airflow. Intake manifold is new. The cylinder heads are new. We stood the ports up really for power and to get real good breathing. And, um, and then our camshafts and the duration and the lifts are really tailored for output. So it's really a, uh, it's a new engine here for us. And to really get 300 horsepower, we had to significantly change it. And 300 really is a bogey for us. And uh, we really wanted that as a, as a very good base entry engine. And that is as much power as V8 engines from just a couple of years ago. You know, this announcement is pretty much what everyone expected, but it is still impressive. The F-150 needed a horsepower boost for years, and now it's finally getting it. You've all heard about the Tata Nano, that little car from India that costs less than a golf car that you see running around on golf courses. But what's it like to drive one? We'll take you on a test drive right after this. Introducing Bridgestone's third generation of run-flat tires with groundbreaking new Bridgestone technologies. Bridgestone run-flat tires offer improved ride comfort, lower rolling resistance, and improved wear while giving you the peace of mind and comfort you need. On a recent tour of Germany, we stopped in to see what the supplier company Continental is up to. We got to see all kinds of new technology, and we also got a chance to drive some of the vehicles that use it. Autoline Daily correspondent Craig Cole took a quick spin in the Tata Nano, and here's what it's like behind the wheel. With anything labeled world's cheapest, you can't expect frills, and the Tata Nano is no exception. Inside, there's a simple instrument panel with a center-mounted gauge cluster and a handful of basic controls. Our test car didn't even have airbags. What it did have was a big floor mat to protect the carpet. It's great at stopping muddy footprints, but it fit like a diaper, all bulky and bunched up. Can you say pedal entrapment? Hand cranks control the windows, and yes, they do go down, but surprisingly, the doors have no stays. They just flop around with nothing to hold them in place. Watch out for your fingers. One advantage, though, is that the doors are feather light and very easy to open. The Nano's 640cc two-cylinder engine is about as smooth as a coffee grinder. It literally vibrates the entire car, and especially the rear seat passengers who sit right on top of it. The sound it makes doesn't help matters either. With only 35 horsepower, acceleration is leisurely. Top speed is 105 kilometers an hour, about 65 miles an hour. As lacking as the performance is, it's nothing to worry about compared to the handling. Even small course corrections while driving down a straight road cause a lot of body roll. This is a very tippy feeling car. For all of its crudeness though, the Nano was a lot of fun. On my short test drive, it felt very mechanical, which is satisfying given how detached modern vehicles can feel. It's actually kind of refreshing to drive a car this basic. Thanks for that report, Craig. In case you were wondering, Continental worked on the Nano's fuel delivery system. Hey, don't forget to tune into AutoLine After Hours tonight, live at 7 p.m. Eastern. Our guest tonight will be Chris DeBear, the head of R&D for a company called Transonic Combustion. And it has what could prove to be a significant automotive breakthrough. They claim they can boost the fuel economy of an engine by 30% just by bolting on their fuel injection system. That's tonight on AutoLine After Hours. And that's it for today's top news in the global automotive industry. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.